Many people have requested that I do a video about Joy Division, and I know this is just one of a litany of ways that you can watch their story, either through like documentaries, books, other videos on YouTube. So I don't think I'm doing anything new here. I don't think I'm going to add any like new perspective to this story, but it's a story that I think is important to tell. I think a lot of times with artists and bands, especially as they get more popular and almost more mythologized, it can become easy to see them as characters, to see them as this larger than life thing. But the story of Joy Division is a really human story and I'm excited to share it. So this is the story of Joy Division. Peter Woodhead was born in 1956 in the Greater Manchester area, and after his parents divorced, he was mostly raised by his grandmother until his mom remarried and he took his new stepfather's last name, Hook. Because of that new stepfather's job, Peter actually spent some time in Jamaica as a kid. Like most kids in the Greater Manchester area of that time, Peter spent a lot of his teenage years just doing random drugs and trying to find any way he possibly could to survive school. Manchester was still really impacted by World War II and the after effects of that, and just this growing industrialization, I think as Bernard says later, kind of destroyed a lot of small communities and turned them into more factory things, so it was just, it was a weird time in Manchester at that point. Towards the end of his schooling years, he really had no idea what he wanted to do with his life. He said he never really even thought about being a musician. Sure, he loved sort of more of those metal bands like Black Sabbath or Deep Purple, but he never saw that as attainable for him. He said in an interview with The Big Takeover, quote, I used to read the music press because I was bored at work. I would be waiting at the news agents to grab sounds, Melody Maker, New Musical Express, and I'd spend all day reading them. So I was very well versed in the ways of musicians. The weird thing was, it never crossed my mind to play. Never. End quote. And he told the Red Bull Music Academy, quote, I never played a musical instrument apart from the recorder at school. End quote. But he did get somewhat interested in pop music when he was younger by doing what most British kids were doing at that time, watching Top of the Pops. He ended up buying a record player from a friend of his who really needed the money and sold his parents' record player without them knowing. And since he spent all of his money on that record player, he couldn't afford any records to play, so he just stole some from a local shop. But it was an album by Cockney Rebel that really kind of ignited that passion for music in him. But even after all of that, he never once thought that he could do that. He never thought it was a career path that was available to him. But all of that changed on June 4th, 1976, when he saw the Sex Pistols play at the Lesser Free Trade hall in Manchester. I've been waiting for a guy to come and take me by the hand. That show has become pretty famous over the years. It's seen as responsible for launching the Manchester punk scene and inspiring most of the prominent bands of the post-punk movement. Basically, all of the cool underground rock music that came out of Manchester, everything from the factory scene to even Oasis, can be traced back to that gig at the Lesser Free Trade Hall and the follow-up gig that occurred a few weeks later. Paul Morley, who was a journalist for the New Music Express at the time, told the BBC, quote, everything that happens is still a fallout of the Sex Pistols coming to the Lesser Free Trade Hall. There's no doubt about it. You can draw it all back to that little explosion at the Lesser Free Trade hall. It's not hard at all. End quote. The gig was organized by Howard DeVoto and Pete Shelley. They had seen the Sex Pistols play in London, and they invited them to come play in Manchester, mostly because they wanted their band, which was recently renamed the Buzzcocks, to open for the Sex Pistols. The Buzzcocks weren't quite ready for that first show, but they did open for them when they came back a few weeks later. Morrissey was at that first show. He wrote to NME about it, saying, quote, Despite their discordant music and barely audible, audacious lyrics, they were called back for two encores. End quote. In typical Morrissey fashion, he thought that he could do it better, so he decided to try. He started the Smiths and then became one of the most important and legendary figures in the post-punk movement. Tony Wilson was there, and he would go on to start The Factory, which was arguably the most important business for this burgeoning Manchester punk scene. Mark E. Smith was there, and that show inspired him to start his band, which became The Fall. Steve Diggle of the Buzzcocks told the BBC, quote, It was amazing to see. That's where it exploded from. It changed Manchester, and it 
change the world. It's also worth noting that as the fame of this gig has spread, way more people claim to have been there than actually could have possibly been there. It's kind of like seeing the Ramones at CBGB. Very few people actually did that, but so many people claim that they did. Howard of the Buzzcocks said there were probably about 40 people there on the first night, but Peter Hook was definitely one of those 40 people. He had seen the Sex Pistols advertised in a magazine called Melody Maker, which showed a picture of Johnny Rotten like fighting someone in the crowd, and Peter thought that that was really interesting, so he kind of already had this understanding of who the Sex Pistols were. So when he saw this gig advertised in the classifieds of the evening news, he figured, this could be fun, and it's pretty cheap, so let's check it out. So he called up a couple of his friends, Terry Mason and Bernard Sumner, and they went to see the Sex Pistols. That show changed everything for Peter. He told the Rolling Stone, quote, I'd never seen anything like it in my life. I'd been to see most groups, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, loads and loads of bands, and I'd never seen anything as chaotic or as exciting and as rebellious as that. It was how I felt. You just wanted to trash everything. It sounded awful, and for some insane reason, you had the blinding realization that you could do it. End quote. The next day, he went to a little store and bought a bass for 35 quid. He said that he bought a bass because his friend Bernard already had a guitar. You can't have two guitars in a punk band at that time. Peter wrote in his book, Unknown Pleasures, quote, I remember feeling as though I'd been sitting in a darkened room all of my life, comfortable and warm and safe and quiet. Then all of a sudden, someone had kicked the door in and it had burst open to let in an intense bright light and this even more intense noise, showing me another world, another life, a way out. The friend that Peter invited, Bernard Sumner, also told the Rolling Stone, quote, It wasn't that the Sex Pistols were musically brilliant and I thought, oh, I really want to be like them. It was the fact that they were not musically brilliant and could just about play together, and it was a right racket. I thought they destroyed the myth of being a pop star, or of a musician being some kind of god that you had to worship. Bernard Sumner was also born in 1956 in the Greater Manchester area. His mother had cerebral palsy, and he never actually knew his father. Like Peter, he grew up with his grandparents. His grandfather was an engineer, and Bernard says that that's probably where he got his love for electronics and technology. He met Peter Hook in grammar school, where they quickly realized they had the same shared interest in pop culture, so they became friends. Peter said they became friends when they both became skinheads, which doesn't mean the same thing now as it did back then. According to Peter, back then it just meant that you liked ska and reggae music. They both got these scooters and put Santana stickers on them and would just kind of ride around Manchester looking for girls that they could pick up. Bernard got a record player for his 16th birthday and picked up a single by the band T-Rex, which really ignited his love of music, specifically guitar music. He particularly loved the riff in Ride a White Swan, but then someone introduced him to Jimi Hendrix and his horizons of what music could be just massively expanded. He told GQ, quote, I realized it wasn't about little catchy tunes. It was what you could do sonically with a guitar, end quote. After school, he got a job at an animation studio called Stop Frame, where he got to work on this, like, children's television show called Jamie and the Magic Torch. Bernard already had a guitar before he saw the Sex Pistols play, but seeing that show really inspired him and Peter and their friend Terry Mason to try and start a punk band. That Sex Pistols show taught them and so many other people who happened to see the Sex Pistols throughout the years that you didn't need to be super musically talented and gifted or even know how to play an instrument to start something powerful and meaningful and do something different with your life. Peter said that seeing the Sex Pistols showed him someone who had the same attitude that he had, this idea that I just want to break stuff. He said that he wanted to trash everything, and seeing the Sex Pistols helped him understand that that's all you needed to be in a band and try and make music. Bernard told Rolling Stone, quote, I bought how to play the guitar. He bought how to play the bass. We went to my grandmother's parlor, which was just across the Irwell. I remember we didn't have any amps. She had an old gramophone from the 40s, and I took the needle out of it and wired two jack sockets on it. It sounded good, plugged into the gramophone. We didn't have any money. That's all we could do. And then we just started writing stuff together, end quote. As Peter Hook said, it's easy to form a group. It's all the rest that's difficult. Terry Mason was an original member of the band. He flitted around, kind of tried a few different roles, including band manager, but nothing ever really fit for him until he became the head roadie and just kind of stuck with that. While the band first started playing instruments for the first time, they also started to develop their aesthetic. Torn clothes, dog collars, spiked hair, the whole thing. They wanted to look like punks. At this time, the Manchester punk scene was just getting off the ground, and it was all centered around the Buzzcocks. The Buzzcocks 
Fox played basically every gig in Manchester and were really quick to encourage any new punk band that was trying to get started in the scene. Their manager, Richard Boone, gave the band their first name, Stiff Kittens, because he said, you have to have a name if we're going to put you on this gig. So he just kind of called them Stiff Kittens on the poster announcing the gig. But it's worth noting that Bernard claims they were never actually called Stiff Kittens. He said in an interview with an online blog called Disorder, quote, We were never called Warsaw and we were never called the Stiff Kittens. We were called Joy Division straight away. They were just names that were thrown around, end quote. Which is interesting because it seems like they very clearly were called Warsaw, so I don't really know what he's getting at with that. Bernard and Peter first met Ian Curtis at the third Sex Pistols gig, which by that point was pretty packed. Ian was wearing this jacket that had hate written across the back of it, so he stood out a bit, but they were all a part of this pretty insular Manchester punk community, so they kind of knew about each other, and the guys knew that Ian was already in a different group that he was trying to get going. But eventually, that band that Ian was in fell apart right around the same time that the Stiff Kittens realized they needed a new singer because Terry Mason wasn't cutting it anymore. And there are basically two different stories about how Ian ended up joining the band. Peter Hook's story is kind of the more simple one. He says that they were at a gig when they bumped into Ian, and Ian mentioned that his band had broken up, so they just invited him into the Stiff Kittens because they were like, you're a singer, we need a singer, you need a band. Let's just do this. But Bernard says that Ian answered an ad that he had put in Village Voice. Bernard told Bonafide Magazine, quote, We were trying to find a singer, and we got a load of lunatics who were applying. Then one guy came through, and it was Ian. I was like, oh, you're the Ian I met at some punk club. He said, yeah, that was me. And I said, okay, you've got the job. He wasn't a lunatic, or at least I didn't think he was a lunatic, end quote. Either way, Ian joined the band, and that's when things became more serious. Ian Curtis was born in Manchester in 1956. His father, Kevin, was a detective officer with the Transport Commission Police. Ian, his younger sister, and their parents were all really close growing up. Right away, Ian showed an aptitude for both learning and for creative pursuits. He loved stories. He loved drawing. His father had written several plays, which taught him the love of storytelling and of writing. And his aunt, Auntie Nell, told him all of these exciting stories about her modeling career, which kind of instilled in him this love of adventure and doing something important. Ian loved music from a really early age, but he wasn't necessarily interested in the top of the pops type music. He was listening to bands like The Velvet Underground and Roxy Music and became really interested in this more rebellious type of character, both in music and in movies. He loved Rebel Without a Cause. When he was 16, Ian met Deborah Woodruff, who was dating one of his best friends named Tony Nuttall at the time. When Tony and Debbie broke up, Ian swooped in, started dating Debbie, and their first date was actually to a David Bowie gig. Debbie later told Mojo that Ian seemed to have a really good childhood. She described it as, quote, wandering around fields, building dams and brooks, chasing pigs. It always puzzled me why he was so obsessed with writing about cityscapes. Maybe he felt guilty that he wasn't trapped in one. Ian was angry, but I was never sure why. End quote. When Debbie learned that Ian had a fascination with death and was really attracted to artists who had died young, she didn't think much of it. She wrote in her book, Touching from a Distance, quote, when he told me he had no intention of living beyond his early 20s, I took it with a pinch of salt, assumed it was a phase and that he would grow out of it. He seemed terribly young to have already made the decision that life was not worth living, end quote. Ian eventually dropped out of his studies and started talking to Debbie about marriage, even though they were still teenagers. But he also started to get pretty possessive and jealous and controlling, at least according to Debbie and her side of the story. He didn't like her to even talk to other guys and he once got her so upset that she tried to break up with him, but he managed to convince her to stay in the relationship. And in 1974, they got engaged. At the engagement party, Ian threw a Bloody Mary on Debbie when he thought she was flirting with his uncle. So not off to a great start, but the next summer they got married. Life as a really young couple wasn't that great. They really struggled with money and Ian had dreams of being a poet. So he spent all of his free time that he wasn't at work writing. But once they settled into a routine, Ian started to get more involved in the music community. He even started his own punk band and went to more and more gigs, including seeing the Sex Pistols at the Lesser Free Trade Hall. He wasn't at the first gig, and he apparently always regretted that, but he did make it to the second one. In her book, Debbie goes along with Bernard's story and says that Ian saw an ad and called Bernard, who invited him into the group. But either way, Ian is now in Stiff Kittens. Terry Mason told Rolling Stone, quote, It was obvious that this guy was serious. He was prepared for it, and he didn't scare us, so we decided to see if we'd like him, end quote. 
On May 29th, 1977, this iteration of the band played their first gig. At the time, they were going by Warsaw, but they were still billed as Stiff Kittens. This was like the poster with the Buzzcocks manager that I was talking about a little bit earlier. They didn't have a drummer, so they recruited a guy named Tony Tabak right like the night before the gig to come play with them, which is absurd. From the start, Warsaw wasn't really loved in the scene, and it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly why. John Cooper Clark wrote in his memoir, quote, Warsaw were no worse or better than anybody else, so why they attracted so much animosity was a mystery to me. I mean, none of them could play very much, but as I've said, limited technical proficiency was one of punk rock's strengths and a large part of its charm." End quote. But Paul Morley saw something in them, something that could be polished into a more interesting sound, and he gave them a great review in NME. Bernard talked about the first batch of songs that they were writing in the Joy Division documentary. He said, quote, "...the first set of material we wrote was just aping punk, really completely aping it and doing it really badly." End quote. The band kept playing and they loved it. Peter was so amped up with adrenaline before most shows that he would just have to like do sprints down the hallways or outside on the sidewalk. They even went into a studio and recorded a demo that's now called the Warsaw Demo, but everyone they gave it to hated it. Terry Mason was still their manager at the time, so he got the job of copying tapes off of the master, which they would do by playing the master and recording it onto a different tape by putting the speakers together, which Terry did while he was watching TV. So you could hear like Coronation Street in the background and his mom calling him and telling him it was time for tea. It was just, the recording was a mess. After that, their drummer, who was a guy named Steve Brotherdale, left to join a band called The Panic. He either left or he was kicked out. There's kind of different stories here too. I saw the story that they wanted to kick him out, so they pretended their van had a flat tire, and when he got out to check, they just kind of drove off and left him there. But either way, he ended up in The Panic, and they needed a new, new drummer. So they did what worked in the past and put up ads looking for a drummer, and that's when Stephen Morris saw one of their ads. Stephen Morris was born in 1957 in Macclesfield. His dad used to host dances and his uncle was a musician, so he grew up in a creative family surrounded by music. Pretty early on, Stephen knew that he wanted to be a drummer. He went to the same school as Ian, but ended up getting expelled, and at the time, he lived really close to Ian and Debbie. In the documentary Joy Division, Stephen recalled that first phone call where he responded to the ad. He said, quote, I expected some oafish poor type, but it was very chatty, very mild-mannered Ian. End quote. When he auditioned for the band, they thought he was amazing right away. Peter said he had that power and aggression that was super necessary for a punk band, but he also said that he added some texture and intricacy into the rhythm section. Steven told Sun 13, quote, Once I'd figured out how to play drums, I wanted to play more riffs on the toms, not straight four on the floor kind of thing. End quote. So that probably gave him a little something extra over other punk drummers at the time who were just kind of banging as hard as they could on the snare drum. Peter said that him and Steven clicked really well musically, but they never really got along all that well personally. Even after all of these years of basically living his life with Steven, he says he doesn't know him all that well. Steven is the kind of guy that's more reserved and keeps to himself, and Peter very much is not. So with the band complete, they set out to be the best band they could possibly be. They continued to play any gigs they could find, and they recorded another demo tape, which also sounded really bad because the engineer let them put way too much music on each side of the record. Ian was getting a little bit desperate for success, and he started to be more and more dramatic on stage. In her book, Touching from a Distance, Debbie quotes Peter saying, it was this contrast of being nice and polite and then totally manic when he was on stage, end quote. They developed their sound by rehearsing at a place called TJ Davidson's, which was this old warehouse that had been converted into rehearsal space. They used to have to like scavenge wood in order to start fires and stay warm in the winter, and since they all had day jobs, they could only rehearse for like a few hours every Saturday. Then they hit a bit of a snag because they started to get confused with another band called Warsaw Pact. Even though Warsaw had been using the name longer, Warsaw Pact was more popular and had even put out a record. So Warsaw needed to change their name. Ian suggested the name Joy Division, which he got from a novella called House of Dolls, which was written by a Holocaust survivor about groups of Jewish women who were kept in concentration camps for the sexual pleasure of Nazi soldiers. Peter said it was better than any of the other ideas that were floating around, but that kind of connection to fascism is something that would haunt them for 
the rest of their careers, even still now a little bit. Around the time of the name change, the band also worked really hard to develop a new sound. It was tighter and slower and less of that aggressive punk that they were doing when they were Warsaw. The band also entered a time of struggling to find gigs. Maybe it was because of the Nazi imagery, maybe it was because of this new sound that was different from the rest of the Manchester punk scene, but no one wanted to book them. In the documentary Joy Division, Steven says, quote, Ian spurred us on to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and write and write and write and get really, really tight so that when we did get a gig, we would show the bastards, end quote. Ian had somehow become friendly with some of the executives at RCA, mostly just by hanging around their office. So when the higher-ups at RCA thought they were missing out on that Manchester punk scene and they wanted a band to record to try and like get into that, they approached Ian because they knew this guy has a band. The band really hated the whole process of recording with RCA and they hated the resulting records, which ended up getting scrapped. So with all of this shifting direction and struggling to get gigs, they really needed someone to step in and handle the business side of things. At that time, they were all taking turns being manager and none of them were any good at it. So enter Rob Gretton. Rob had seen the band play in 1978. I think they were still Warsaw at that point. And the next day he saw Bernard in a telephone booth and kind of cornered him and asked to be the band's manager. His first order of business was remastering the Ideal for Living EP, which was the demo that they recorded and put too much music on one side so it sounded terrible. And he wanted to remaster that so he could hand it out to people and show people the Joy Division sound. Rob also got them involved in the Musicians Collective in Manchester so they were able to get gigs more regularly. He also organized their finances and was able to fund a few things for them. He was really just that business sense that the band needed to take that next step in their career. Debbie said that Ian started to look at Rob and his wife as kind of surrogate parents while he was with the band and doing that side of his life. But as you do with your parents sometimes, Ian also butted heads with Rob. Before Rob came in, Ian was the creative force of the band. Ian was the one who introduced the band to interesting new artists and influenced their sound quite a lot. But Rob was this larger than life personality who had a lot of ideas about how the band should operate. And that led to some tension with kind of all of them, but more Ian and Rob than anyone else. Ian also had the added pressure of Debbie being pregnant. So... He probably bristled more than the others at the idea of Rob controlling the money because now Ian had another mouth to feed. Debbie later admitted that their decision to start a family at that point was not a smart one, but Debbie was around all of these friends at her university who were all having children and she started to feel a little bit jealous. Ian was a really big people pleaser, so he figured if having a baby would make Debbie happy, then sure he would do that. I think he also assumed that Joy Division would be massive by the time the baby was born, so he, they wouldn't need to worry about money at all. In April of 1979, their daughter Natalie was born. During this period, Ian experienced quite another drastic life change. In December of 1978, the band were driving back from a gig and it hadn't really gone that well, probably because Bernard had the flu, so things in the van were already pretty intense. There was a little bit of an argument, and then Ian stole Bernard's sleeping bag and wrapped it around his head and started thrashing around. Turns out, he was having his first seizure. They took him to a hospital in Luton, because it was the closest one to where they were, where he was given a few pills and then recommended back to his primary doctor in Macclesfield, who officially diagnosed him with epilepsy and gave him even more pills. Once they got him back home to Debbie, they went to see more doctors, but they seemed just unable or unwilling to help much, so his fits became more frequent and more violent. He was scared to even hold his daughter, Natalie, in case he had a seizure and dropped her. But despite all that, the band couldn't stop, and they just kept playing gigs. And at these shows, Ian started to do this weird kind of dance thing that has become famous now, but at the time, it just kind of mimicked what he looked like when he was having a seizure. So at a certain point, it became tough for the rest of the guys in the band to know if he was having a seizure or if he was just playing it up for the crowd. The audience, who didn't know anything about Ian's epilepsy, thought it was just an erratic frontman of a punk band. Peter wrote in his autobiography about the effect that the medication had on Ian. He said, quote, he felt embarrassed about the condition and how the drugs affected him. We saw bits of that. His mood changed a bit. He was quieter, less ready to laugh, and more introverted than before, which was understandable. Otherwise, he just soldiered on. End quote. So they were playing as many gigs as they possibly could, traveling a lot, and all working day jobs. So they all started to feel 
really exhausted. Peter even remembers passing out at work several times during this period. Even still, couldn't stop, couldn't take a break, so they started talking about making an album. Tony Wilson was a longtime member of the Manchester music scene, and he had started the factory with the goal of helping to promote this Manchester scene that he loved so much. The factory started as a club for these bands to play in, but then he had the idea that he could put out records for the bands that hadn't managed to get a record contract yet, so he started Factory Records. Joy Division had two offers on the table. They had Factory Records, which would allow them to record in Manchester, have a bigger share of royalties, but really no advance, or a London label that had a really big advance, but would require them to go to London to record and wasn't part of the Manchester scene, didn't really understand the sound as much. After some back and forth, Joy Division signed with Factory Records. So in April of 1979, they headed to Strawberry Studios in Stockport to start working with the producer Martin Hannett. Martin had a kind of unusual approach to recording for the time. He wanted the live feeling, but he loved isolating each sound as much as he could, to the point where Steve would have to take apart his drum set and was like, just playing the snare on certain tracks. He would also add in random noises like the sound of the elevator shaft, and he'd give them super vague instructions about how he wanted them to play to the point where the band kind of saw him as the mad scientist. And he saw them as naive beginners who would let him try any experiment that he wanted to because they didn't know any better. In an interview in 1988 quoted in the Joy Division documentary, Martin said, quote, they didn't have a clue. I could work out loads of little things on them and they wouldn't squabble or argue or say why, end quote. The resulting album Unknown Pleasures was released in June of 1979 and the band had split opinions on it. Ian and Steve loved it. Bernard and Peter kind of hated it. He thought that Martin had taken the guts out of the songs. He says now he understands what Martin was doing and he was wrong back then, but when he first heard it, he likened it to hearing those early demos for the first time and just thinking, this is a disaster. Joy Division Live was this kind of aggressive, loud, more punk type band, and that's what Peter loved. Peter was really about that attitude and just trashing everything and anger and aggression, and this album wasn't that. It was more toned back, so he thought it just completely ruined the songs. But looking back now, he understands what Martin was doing and thinks it was incredible. Peter said in a video on the Joy Division YouTube channel that Martin gave them an incredible gift with that album. He took this album that these kids had kind of accidentally made with some incredible songs and turned it into something eternal. Martin turned the songs into something thoughtful and evocative. He gave them longevity. He gave them a legacy. Bernard designed the album cover that has since become iconic. They initially printed 10,000 copies of the album, but they sold out of that within six months, and by the end of the year, they had sold 15,000 copies. Although it wasn't much, like it's certainly not going to let you quit your day job, that was a pretty big number for an independent punk band from Manchester. The album was completed in three weekends, including mastering, which is an incredible achievement for an album that is now iconic. Bernard and Steven said that hearing the recording was the first time that they truly listened to some of Ian's lyrics, and they thought it was kind of strange. When he was with the band, Ian was a typical young guy, drinking beer, pulling pranks, getting into shenanigans, but his lyrics showed a different, darker side to him. Bernard said in an interview with GQ UK, quote, when you did hear his lyrics, it wouldn't really marry up with the person because the person was quite lighthearted and jovial, but obviously with a bookish side to him. When you heard these lyrics, which sounded intensely personal, it felt like you were intruding on something that was really private to him. End quote. Peter Hook said that because they played so loud, he could never understand what Ian was saying when they played live, and hearing the record was the first time that he heard the lyrics. He told NME, quote, When I heard what Ian was singing, I was just really proud. It was a wonderful feeling of power and contentment to know that you had that in the band's arsenal. I think people were very touched by Ian. It struck a chord with a lot of lonely, depressed people who felt they didn't quite fit in life, end quote. Thinking about the lasting impact of that record, Steven said in the same GQ article, quote, Looking back, I don't know how we did it. It's one of those things. You can't decide to make a timeless record, even though at the back of your mind, that was always what you wanted it to be. 
And that's what we got, end quote. But since they didn't take that record deal that offered them a really large advance, they still needed to make money. So they went right back out on the road and toured the album, even though Ian in particular really needed a break. The album was received really well critically, so Joy Division became the super in-demand band and they wanted to capitalize on that. It was exhausting for all of them, but at least the rest of the guys got a little bit of a break in between gigs. Ian went from touring and playing exhausting shows to going home to a marriage that was falling apart. Rob instituted a no girls policy, which some of the other guys kind of ignored, but Ian obeyed, at least when it came to Deborah. So Debbie was all but shut out of that part of Ian's life. She didn't know what was going on with the band. She never really saw them play. She never heard the songs until the album came out. Plus, Ian was never great at communicating with her and only wanted to please everyone, so she really had no idea what was going on in his mind and in his life. Debbie claims that the rising fame also brought easier access to drugs, and she said that the combination of drugs with the medication Ian was already on for his epilepsy was really bad. She wrote in her memoir, Touching from a Distance, quote, As the pressure of playing and traveling built up through July and August, Ian's fits became more frequent, and I found it increasingly difficult to communicate with him beyond finding out what kind of sandwiches he wanted, end quote. She said that his mental condition really started to degrade, and his medication and his therapy brought about pretty massive behavioral changes, she thought he had started to resent her. And then Joy Division played a show in London at a place called the Nashville Room, which several of the guys mentioned being a super pivotal moment for him. That was a moment where they felt like Joy Division was on their way to making it because the Nashville Room was kind of legendary in this community. That was also the first time that Anique Honoré saw the band. <laughs> She was writing for a Belgian magazine, kind of covering music a little bit, so she went up to the soundboard and asked whoever was there, which happened to be Rob, if she could do an interview with the band. She said, quote, That was funny to him, something foreign, but I'm not sure he knew exactly where Belgium was. End quote. In an interview with New Music in 2010, Anique recounted the first time she met the band. She said, quote, They are very nice, very friendly, flattered that a foreign magazine would be interested in them. We listen to Bowie's Low, and little by little, everyone falls asleep, except Ian and me. End quote. Then she fell in love. Ian first told Debbie about Anique after a show in Brussels. He told Debbie that Anique was a chubby Belgian girl that was a tour manager, and Ian felt kind of sorry for her and needed to protect her from Rob. But none of that was really true, and I don't think Debbie really thought much about it at the time, but she did notice a subtle change in Ian's personality after he started being with Anique. She said that he became more serious and somber, and he stopped sharing his life with Deborah. Joy Division started supporting the Buzzcocks on their fall tour and by all accounts blew them away. Apparently the Buzzcocks had gotten a little bit comfortable and complacent by that point in their careers and Joy Division were still super hungry for success. So even though they were outperforming the Buzzcocks on pretty much every show, you could tell that the relentless touring schedule was really hard on Ian. Ian told BBC Blackburn, quote, I'd hate to be on the usual record company where you get an album out and you do a tour and all this and that and the others. I couldn't just do that at all. We had experience of that supporting the Buzzcocks. It was really soul destroying, you know, at the end of it, end quote. But through having a powerful record, a manager who seemed to know what he was doing, a great tour with a huge band, it seemed like Joy Division were on the brink of an absolute breakthrough. But as the tour with the Buzzcocks dragged on and on, it really started to impact Ian's health. He was having seizures more and more frequently, including on stage, but he wouldn't let himself rest and just kept pushing on. In his book, Peter also mentioned how Ian brought Anique on tour with him and that changed how Ian acted. She didn't like him hanging out with the guys, so he became more withdrawn. Peter wrote, quote, he changed when he was with her. That chameleon aspect of him coming out again. Was he more himself when he was with Anique or more himself when he was pissing about with us? There's the eternal question, end quote. As the band grew more and more successful, they started to drift further and further apart. Even though they clicked exceptionally well musically, Personally, they started bickering and arguing about almost everything. On top of that, Ian was dealing with a really tumultuous home life. Debbie had finally confronted him and he confessed to his relationship with Anique and told Deborah that he was going to break it off with Anique. It's worth noting that his relationship with Anique was never physical. According to Peter, the medication that Ian was on for his epilepsy made it impossible for him to be physically intimate with anybody. The medication was just that heavy and that was one of the side effects of it. Anique confirmed that as well with an interview with New Music. She said, quote, It was a completely pure and platonic relationship, very childish, very chaste. 
I didn't have a sexual relationship with Ian. He was on medication, which rendered it a non-physical relationship, end quote. Anik also said that in his letters, Ian said that his relationship with Deborah was already over by the time him and Anik got together. But I think she'd have to be pretty heavily deluding herself if she spent as much time around the band as she did without knowing that Ian was still married to Deborah. The stress of this insane touring schedule with his home life breaking down led Ian to have kind of a mental breakdown and he ended up cutting himself with a kitchen knife. So things were getting really intense and the band decided to slow down a bit, pump the brakes, record another album and gear up for a tour of the US. For this album, the band decided to leave Manchester and they headed down to London where they went to Britannia Row Studios to start working on the record in March of 1980. Stephen told GQ, quote, The first thing that impressed me about Britannia Row was you got a little basket of sandwiches every morning. It was like, this is the big time, end quote. Rob kept up his no girls policy, but apparently that didn't apply to Anique. Rob rented them two flats in London, kind of side by side. Bernard, Peter, and Stephen would stay in one and Ian and Anique stayed in the other one. I think it's fair to say that London has a bit more of the like artsy culture than Manchester so while they were staying there to work on the album Ian started to get a little bit more pretentious at least as the other guys saw it they made fun of him for constantly going with Anique to art galleries and exhibitions he withdrew more and more from the rest of the band while he put more of himself into the relationship with Anique Peter said that looking back now it's really easy to see how much Ian was struggling both mentally and physically but he worked so hard to hide it from everyone. He hid it from his doctors, his wife, his parents, the band, basically everyone. Peter said in an interview with Yahoo, quote, Ian wanted success. He wanted us to achieve what he felt we deserved. So we hid it, and that was the problem. He would never let you know how poorly he was, end quote. While waiting for the album to be finished and the USA tour to start, the band should have taken some time off to rest and prepare for that, but they needed to raise some money for the U.S. tour, so they started playing some shows. They had a brief residency at the Moonlight Club in Hampstead, and those shows were really hard on Ian. In her book, Debbie quotes Bernard saying, When I look back now, we did some gigs that we shouldn't have done. He had a fit and went on, and we did the Moonlight, and he was really ill, and he did the gig. That was really stupid, end quote. The long nights and unpredictable schedule made Ian's seizures even worse, to the point where when they got back to Manchester on Easter Sunday, Ian left a note and then took an overdose of his epilepsy medication. He told Debbie what he did. She was able to call an ambulance and get him to the hospital to have his stomach pumped in time. And somehow, while he was in the hospital, a psychiatrist said that Ian was not suicidal, which sounds absurd, but I guess that's kind of... Ian. He was able to show people what they wanted to see. So he was even able to fool a psychiatrist into thinking that, oh, he's fine. It's not exactly clear why he told Debbie that he had taken this overdose and allowed her to kind of prevent it. Maybe he was afraid that if it wasn't successful, it would leave him with brain damage. Maybe he just had second thoughts. But while he was at the hospital, it was suggested that Ian stay with Tony Wilson and his wife instead of going home with Debbie in order to ease some of the pressure of that home life. Ian went straight from the hospital to a gig, which for me personally, this is the point where I kind of start shaking my head a little bit. We weren't there and it's hard to know what it was like in the moment, but it's just so hard for me to imagine them not realizing that Ian needed help and needed a break. No matter what he said, it was clear from his actions that something wasn't right. But I also think it's worth noting that mental health is taken more seriously now. So maybe back then it was kind of that attitude of just, just toughen up and deal with it. He says he's fine. He's fine. Let's just get on with it kind of thing, which so hard. It's so hard now to hear it and be like, man, there are so many times where something could have been done and it was just overlooked. On April 11th, they played the newly opened second version of the factory and Debbie came to that show. It was there that she learned that Ian was still seeing Anique. It was also where she learned that Ian was living with Anique during the recording of their second album. Then Ian told her that he needed a bit of a break and he was going to go stay by himself in this little, like, bed and breakfast in a small village. But Debbie had her suspicions, so she called Rob to ask where is Ian, what's going on. On that call, Rob was pretty short with her, but he didn't tell her that it was because Ian and Anique were currently sitting in his living room and he was getting tired of all of this drama. But that was the final straw for Debbie. At a loss of what to do, Debbie called her parents and told them about everything that was happening. 
her parents called Ian's parents and filled them in, and they were all just kind of shocked to hear about what had been going on. Ian was furious that she had basically told on him to his parents. They had this understanding that whatever was going on in their relationship, they could work out between themselves. So Debbie broke that by going to their parents. Debbie knew that by going to Ian's parents, she was essentially losing him forever. So she started divorce proceedings against him. She even called up Anique, who was back in London, and basically yelled at her over the phone saying, was all her fault. Meanwhile, the band, who finally was taking a little bit of time off so Ian could rest and recover, were busy rehearsing for the U.S. tour. They even made a music video for Love Will Tear Us Apart. On May 2nd, 1980, Joy Division played at High Hall Birmingham University. It would be their last gig. Peter said they were all super excited about going to America, Ian specifically, because he loved The Doors and William Burroughs and all of these American artists, and he just wanted to be where they were. They had a music video in the works. They had a new album coming out soon. They felt on top of the world. It seemed like they were ready to take that step into the next part of their career, and finally breaking into the U.S. market was a way to do that. On Friday night, Peter drove Ian back to his parents' house after a really great practice. They were leaving for the tour that Monday, and he said they were just jumping up and down in his car and screaming and just so excited to finally get to America. The next day, Saturday, Bernard called Ian and asked if he wanted to come hang out with the guys, but he said no because he needed to go see Debbie and talk about the divorce. Debbie was working as a waitress, and she had a couple of events that she needed to work on that Saturday, but she thought it might be worth seeing Ian Sunday because she was off all of Sunday. Their daughter, Natalie, was staying with Debbie's parents that weekend, so during a break in between her events on Saturday, Debbie went home in order to talk to Ian for a bit. After working another event that Saturday evening, Debbie went home and saw Ian drinking coffee and watching a movie. They once again argued about the divorce and Debbie's refusal to drop it. Ian was getting really worked up during this argument, so Deborah kind of wanted to stay with him and make sure he would be okay with his like ep epilepsy and seizures. So Debbie went home and told her parents that she was going to go stay with Ian that night. When she got back, Ian seemed to have calmed down and he told her, I don't really want you here. Please go back to your parents and don't come back to our house until after 10 a.m. on Sunday. I think he had like train tickets or something so he would be out of the house by that point on Sunday. Debbie agreed and left and went to stay with her parents. When she left, Ian grabbed a couple photos of Natalie and Deborah put on The Idiot by Iggy Pop and sat down to write Debbie a really long letter. According to what he wrote in the letter, he finished writing it around dawn. Sunday morning, well after the 10 a.m. time frame, Debbie brought Natalie back to the house. The curtains were drawn, but she could see some light through them, so she thought Ian might still be there. She came into the house and saw him kneeling in the kitchen, and at first she was confused about what he was doing there, and then she got closer and saw that he had hanged himself with a cord from the clothesline. He was only 23 years old. Debbie said in an interview around the time that her book was coming out that she still struggles to read that letter that he wrote her because, quote, he says things that he should have said when he was alive, end quote. That morning, Peter was having breakfast when he got a phone call from a detective with the news of Ian's death. Peter said he was stunned and just sat back down and kept eating because... He didn't know what else to do. Peter wrote in his memoir, quote, Me, I felt guilty. Guilty that, like everybody else, I went along with Ian when he said he was all right. That I was so wrapped in my own bit of me, of the band, that I never took the time to listen to his lyrics or him and thinking, he really needs help, end quote. Bernard Sumner said in an interview with The Guardian, quote, I was still very shocked, saddened, depressed, and because we'd put so much effort into making Joy Division our futures, I was really angry at Ian that he'd bailed out. But at the same time, I felt very deeply sorry that he felt the need to take his own life. I understood why he did it, end quote. A few months before his death, Ian had called Stephen and said that he wanted to quit the band, move to the Netherlands, and open a bookshop. Stephen said that he told Ian to go for it. Speaking to the Times, Stephen said, quote, Now, looking back, I wonder if he just wanted me to say, No, no, don't. We need you. Maybe he wanted me to show him a bit of love. But I just thought if a bookshop is what would make him happy, he should do it. End quote. He said in the same interview, quote, I can give you a million answers, yet none of them would be right, because I wasn't in his head. Also, the other thing you ask is, what could you have done about it? That's the thing that never goes away. And that haunts you. It really haunts you. End quote. Two months after his death, the band released their second album, Closer. It's another masterpiece, and it's widely regarded as one of the best albums released by a British rock band. After Ian's death, 
Peter, Stephen, and Bernard couldn't play Joy Division songs and they couldn't talk about Ian in interviews, so Joy Division ended. They wouldn't play any Joy Division songs for close to 10 years after Ian's death. They eventually kept going as a band called New Order with Bernard taking over on vocals and the addition of Steven's girlfriend playing keyboards. This video is already super long, so I'm not gonna talk about New Order. That's a separate topic entirely. At the start of this, I said that it's a very human story. It's a story about people who allowed themselves to be deceived by someone they really loved, who really cared about them also. It's a story about people who were so blinded by their possible future and the work they were doing that they didn't take the time to stop and talk with each other and talk to the people that they cared about. And that's not a judgment on the other three guys, the managers, Debbie. It's not a judgment on any of them. It's saying that it's a very human thing. We all do that. We're all so wrapped up in our own worlds and what we want that we don't take the time to talk to other people and just kind of figure out what's going on and are they okay. It's also the story of a man who was deeply flawed and who had a ton of struggles but use that to fuel something beautiful. Honestly, when I was researching this, to me, it was mostly a story of what ifs and missed chances. It's also a reminder for all of us to listen to the people we care about, to understand maybe what they aren't saying, to check in on them and actually care. I think it's tempting with this story in particular, but with others generally, to see Ian and the other members of the band almost as characters in a TV show or a movie to kind of make them into mythological figures. Most of us never met Ian. We didn't know him at all, but through his music and his lyrics and the movies made about him, we feel like we know him, but we don't. And I think it's important that we remember that he was a real person. He was someone who was deeply loved as just a human being. And I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of that in the face of Ian's legacy and his mythology. Often we can become so focused on Ian's work of losing such an artistic talent so young that we miss the human element. We miss the real tragedy. I think Peter Hook said it best towards the end of his book, quote, I thought that the worst thing that had happened was me losing a friend, the band losing a member. I'll add in here for me and I think a lot of other musical fans, I thought that the worst thing that had happened was the world losing such an incredible artistic talent. Peter goes on, It took me a long time to realize that a child had lost a father. A mother and father had lost a son. A sister had lost a brother. A wife had lost a husband. A mistress had lost a lover. All a lot more important than me and the band. We pale in significance. End quote. 